All right, welcome back. We are game 2014. That's Mobile Game Development 1 at George Brown College uh, in the fall 2021 semester. And it's week two, part one of our broadcast. And what we're talking about today and for the first part is kind of uh, mobile uh, development fundamentals or mobile design fundamentals for uh, mobile game dev, right, specifically. So where are we sitting right now? We're sitting at uh, week two. Um, last week, we did kind of an intro to mobile game dev, and we set up our, we did a kind of an example lab that wasn't for Marks uh, as an example, and we, we went through building Unity for the first time using a tool called Git Kraken. Um, and this week, what we're going to do is we're going to continue with that, and we're going to add in um, an actual lab for Marks, which is going to do this Friday at midnight. I'm also going to be talking about this week, we're going to be talking about assignment one, part one details. Assignment one is going to be due two weeks from now. That's on fr uh, Friday, the 1st of October, uh, 2021 at midnight. So a couple weeks away. So not this Friday, but two Fridays, three Fridays from now for, for the most part. Uh, that's when it's going to be due. So October 1st. And uh, we're going to talk about the details of what that entails um in this session so i'm going to start with that uh right now but before we get there before we start are there any questions from the people that are online right now with me we have some people on uh on youtube as well as people here in class using zoom um remember you're being recorded anyone have any questions you can put it in the chat or but if you're good to go i'll move on Okay, doesn't look like we have any questions, but if you do have something, you can post it in chat. If you're brave, you can always come on the mic and say, Tom, excuse me, but, or put up your hand as a reaction in Zoom. It's up to you. Okay, let's continue. So, um, you know, we're talking about mobile game dev, game design today, and specifically assignment one, part one details. Um, what I'd like to do right now is bring those details up and talk about what they are. So let's go all the way to the top. I've already done this for the first class. And so what you're doing is you're building a Unity arcade game for mobile. Okay, so that's what you're doing. So keep that in mind, the arcade game idea. This is due, the first part of your game, there's two parts. Uh, the first part of your game is due October 1st, that's Friday, October 1st, 2021 at midnight. Um, it's an individual assignment, so you're doing it on your own. Okay, you're not doing it with anybody else. You're not collaborating with anybody. It's your own stuff. Again, remember this semester what we're doing is I'm getting you guys to build your own stuff so you can build up capability uh, from a Unity perspective um, throughout the semester. So that's what we're doing here. So the Unity Arcade game for mobile, um, it's out of 100 marks. And what you're doing is you're working alone. It's worth 10% of your final grade too. Um, you will create a we say somewhat original 2D arcade game using the Unity game engine uh, or create something new. And what I mean something new is if you've already done um, a, um, an arc, you know, kind of a work with an arcade game before that you want to use, you can. Um, we'll talk about the games that are acceptable and not right now. The game that can be, that you can create can be a scrolling game, tower defense game, three quarter down adventure game, or other classic arcade game. Classic arcade game, Space Invaders, Missile Command, uh, something crazy like that. Some kind of classic ar ar arcade game, uh, Pac-Man, if you really want to. However, I'd ask you not to make Qbert again, since you've already made it with Unreal. I don't want to see that again. Um, and the game should not include any physics whatsoever. So that's going to be one of those, those things that you say, should I make this game? And the question is, does it include physics? of any type, if it includes physics, the answer is you can't make that game, okay? Well, that's cool, Harmon. Uh, but yeah, don't make Qbert again is what I'm saying. Um, so puzzle games, car racing games, and role-playing games specifically are not accepted, all right? So they're, they're not acceptable uh, for a couple of reasons. Puzzle games, even though they're a good mobile game to make, take a long time to make properly, and it's a little bit out of scope of what we're doing in this course. Car racing games typically are terrible, and people use them as a quick way of slapping together a game, so that is not acceptable. 
Um, maybe in the next semester, if you were going to make a 3D car racing game, that's different. But 2D car racing, racing games are boring, typically, and don't work properly. Role-playing games, um, you're making one for Joss. Chances are, if I'm not wrong, kind of a kind of an adventure game with Joss. So that's why I'm asking you not to do that with me. And also, role-playing game in general takes a long time to make. And we don't have all of the entire semester for you to do one game. We're doing a couple of different kinds of games uh, with me this semester. So that's why role-playing games not acceptable. There's also some other games that will not be accepted. Example would be something like Flappy Bird. Please don't make Flappy Bird, uh, you know, or that kind of stuff. Uh, anything that is um, like a clickable game, like a idle type of game. They asked about it earlier this this uh, this today's session, where it's like a cookie clicker kind of game. None of that's acceptable. Um, it's got to be an arcade game. So think, look up arcade game, and that's what you're going to try and make. Um, and if you have a question about that, check with me before you make it. Um, you can always connect with me on Discord if you have a question. Um, the game must have a menu screen, an instruction screen, and at least one game level screen and a game over screen. I'm only asking you for this semester to create one somewhat polished level. That's all I really need. I don't need more than one polished level. Uh, for this semester. So if you want to make more, you can. If you have the if you have the cycles in your schedule to do so, I don't. But if you do, go ahead. Um, but I'm only looking for one polished level if you can. Okay. Uh, a scoring system must be included. You, it all, also could be some kind of level progression system. You must use your own graphic and sound assets. What this means is I don't need you to make graphic and sound assets but I'm asking you to acquire them, all right? So that means go up and grab your stuff uh, as an example from, could be an open game art or some other place. And what you want to do with those graphic and sound assets is you want to include them in your game, but make sure you give credit to the place where you got them. Um, you can also use assets from the Unity Asset Store because we are using Unity. However, uh, scriptable assets are not acceptable. So I don't want you to use assets from the Unity Asset Store that gives you all the script that you need and you're just going to basically slam your game together and make it work. Okay. You must use the Unity game engine and the C Sharp programming language. And I got to specify that um, things like uh, low code or no code solutions. So using some kind of non scriptable pipeline, like for example, um, Bolt for Unity is not acceptable. I didn't mention that earlier, but I got to mention that here because some people will try and do this with no code. And can you do it? Yes, you can. Do I want you to do that? No, I don't. You need to code. That's what this program is all about. So C Sharp programming is a must. You will also be required to deploy the game to a device simulator or emulator to demonstrate it via a demo video. So that's required. And the reason why I say device simulator here is because Unity has a built-in device simulator, which we saw last week, and you can use that for this build for this time. Some people are still having trouble with LD player uh, or other kinds of uh, emulators. So I'm okay with it wor working in the simulator for this particular build. Uh, Kira is asking, um, can we use something like Text Mesh Pro? Yes, you can. That's okay. That's just another package that's built into Unity. So it's okay to do that. But anything else, like if if, uh, if you have a question about downloading a package that includes code, unless I otherwise tell you to, you should ask, you know, to, to see that it's okay. Any code that I share with you, obviously that's okay. Uh, any code from any kind of book resources from the course, that's okay. Um, any code that's shared with you on the Unity um, uh, documentation site from Unity Technologies, that's okay. Uh, but some code that you may find inside the asset store, um, other than a um, a game like a player controller, player controllers um, probably going to allow you to use a player controller because they can be quite difficult to um, to set up manually. That's okay too. But other than that, if you're using other code or you watched a Brackies video. Someone asked earlier, if I what if I watch Brackies? Can I use their code? The answer is no, unless 
And if you're going to use it, you you got to ask. You got to say, is it okay if I use Bracky's uh, code from their video? Because the stuff that we're sharing, I'm sharing with you this semester, plus the stuff that you're getting from Joss, is Joss's stuff okay? Yes, it is. Here's a great thing: if you really wanted to remake your the first part of uh, of uh, of your game in mobile, taking some assets that you're using for uh, for from Joss's uh, course, the stuff that you're making for that game, you want to make use the same assets but make your game for me, as long as they're your assets and you're not sharing them with anybody else, then I'm good to go. What about assets from uh, from last year, um, parts of programs from last year? You're okay as long as, again, it meets the requirements of what I'm asking you to do here. So I don't want you to, just making any random game isn't gonna work. And remember, there's no physics. So it can't be a platformer um, and it can't be something where there's something dropping out of the sky or nothing, nothing like that. It's gonna be using, um, uh, kinematics that you're creating uh, from hand, by hand, if you will, okay? Next, um, the thing that you want to do is, let's take a look here. So this is a, a part one of a two-part assignment, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of important to note, that this is only the first part, um, you know, that uh, of the assignment. There's going to be another part that follows this one. For this part, the only thing that I'm asking you to do is do your UI and level design as well as your game planning. So there is no code required for this first part. This first part is all planning and user interface stuff. You're going to put actually stuff inside of your game project. You're going to pose it, but there's no logic required, okay, for this game. So one thing I ask you to do is acquire or create, if you have time, your assets, okay? So triggers and player input handling, that sort of thing from what you did last semester is okay. All right, so instructions. So you're gonna make a menu screen, which is gonna be the game start state, and it'll allow the user to get ready and display at least two options. So the two options that you're gonna allow, that you're gonna ask the user for is the play option or instructions option, okay? And then you're going to ensure that you acquire or create UI elements that are appropriate for this screen. And you want to include some kind of background image or tile map for your start screen. Okay, that's the first thing. You can do a lot of this, even though the buttons may not work, you can do a lot of this even now without any logic whatsoever. Okay, so that's the first screen. So you need to create the screen, make the buttons, and some kind of background image that makes sense for your game. An instruction screen. Um, this will display rules and instructions on how to win the game and how to play the game. Um, this screen or scene uh, can be completed right now, really, at the end of the day. There's no coding required, so you don't have to do anything here. It's just instructions. What I'd ask you to do is don't create a wall of text uh, to explain stuff. Use images or multiple scenes that you can go next, next, next. You can kind of step through you know, how to play the game with multiple scenes in your instructions area. So it could be one or more screens is what I'm looking for. Um, so again, wall of text, not visually appealing. I recommend you not do that. A UI element should be included that will be used to move back to the menu. So it could be a back button or back to menu a button if you have multiple screens here uh, to kind of step the user through the instructions. Um, Include some kind of appropriate background image or tile map for this section of either whether it's one or more screens that you're adding in here. Okay. Now your gameplay screen is where all the fun happens. The game occurs here and the game will have at least one game level screen. You can have more. I recommend sticking to one nicely polished level. That's enough for this uh, particular assignment. Remember, you're going to do two of these, two big assignments this semester. One of them is going to be a platformer. So. Again, are you going to be able to dedicate and commit all the time to doing one game this entire semester? The answer is no. So just give the amount of time here that you need to make this, uh, you know, this this uh, project uh, nice. Um, each game level has got to be functionally different than every other if you choose to make more levels. And each level must have a unique goal. You will create only the UI elements for this particular assignment. Place your player's avatar and enemies on the screen in a static pose inside the level that you're making, right? 
and include an appropriate background graphic or tile map for the level. So what you're doing is you're just posing, you're creating the level, but there's no motion, okay? There's no animation that's required. If you want to add motion, if you want to add animation, if you want to add other elements, you may. Do you have to? No, you don't. Why? I just want you to get the assets, get your level planned and built as, as, uh, as best as you can. So this uh, exercise is really about level building. Make your level, put your elements in there. There's nothing in there that's working, but you've got everything that you need, including sounds, graphics, backgrounds, tiles, everything that you need for your, for your game. So you need to do that as soon as possible. Your game over screen, again, um, this will display the player's final score or some kind of stats for the player if there's no final score. Um, and it will give the player the option to play again. So some kind of play restart button or whatever. Um, again, there's, there's a lot of options here. Or somehow return to the main menu. One of those two things. And whether you win or you lose, it's kind of a game over screen, right? Um, this screen will be mostly completed because there's no real code to be put here. Uh, as an example, and uh, create a UI element that allows the player to go back to the gameplay screen with some kind of button or other other kind of thing, um, and include appropriate background graphic or tile map. Now, when I keep saying that appropriate tile, you know, background graphic or tile map, I mean different ones. So that means there's got to be a different one for the start screen, for the gameplay screen, for the instruction screen, for the end scene. So you need some assets to collect, please, for this uh, this particular game project. The player eventually, not now, will control an avatar. It could be a vehicle or a character. Uh, the main input may be a combination of touch or some kind of uh, gestures. I don't, I, even though it says accelerometer here, unless you have an actual phone you're testing with, I don't recommend the accelerometer, but you could use it if you really want to, the gyro and the accelerometer. Uh, the player's avatar may have weapons or other devices that they use to defeat the computer controlled enemies. Uh, select an appropriate avatar for your game and place it in the gameplay screen where it would normally start. So again, no need for it to move, no need to have any logic, but it has to be placed in the scene in the right spot. Your game will include enemies or hazards with simple AI behavior eventually, not right now, but eventually, which will include things like line of sight or radius detection and maybe some simple uh, steering behaviors, similar to what we learned in physics, okay? Um, the enemies or hazards in the game should be abundant enough to challenge the player, but not be impossible to beat. And you will acquire or create, if you have time, appropriate enemy assets and place them into the gameplay screen in the appropriate pose. So again, do I need you to actually make them move around the AI? No, you don't. Okay. Well, what about if you don't have AI, you have hazards, put them where they're supposed to be, but there's really no effect. Okay. Your game will include random opportunities to generate points for the player aside from killing enemies. Um, so example could be pickups, treasure, loot drops, whatever you have. There'll be something like that in your game. You must include some element like that. And then include some kind of appropriate assets and place them in the gameplay screen where they might appear during gameplay. So example, maybe you could give an example of an enemy that has that's died. Maybe you put them in death pose, show that uh, piece of the animation and then leave the loot around them if that's what you were going to do, okay? It could be an example of what you did, or you could just have some kind of star or coin or something else that's in the game if there's it doesn't require that, okay? Uh, your game will include some kind of scoring system or other means of showing uh, progression to the player because that's important to show progression um, and ensure you create the appropriate UI elements that will show the player score or progression in the gameplay screen, okay? And then the player uh, must have a life counter or some kind of health status. Example, this could be a health bar or parts or whatever you want to include that decreases each time his avatar is killed or hurt or hit uh, by an enemy. Include appropriate UI elements in the gameplay screen to show that you've done that. So somebody notice I say include these UI elements, include the background screen. It's all assets is what you're doing. Your game will include sound effects for collisions with enemies, collecting points, shooting attacks, explosions, uh, button presses, etc. Acquire or create appropriate assets and place them in the appropriate folder in your project because you can't really test them in the gameplay uh, instance because there's no code. Okay. And Nathan's asking, for Space Invaders, could that be the bases breaking slowly? Yeah, you could include, again, different sound effects for the bases breaking slowly. 
You could include uh, the actual bases breaking slowly as a couple of different uh, instances or states of the asset where you would have an animation state that you're switching to. There's lots of ways to do that. Again, if you're making Space Invaders, I'm hoping you're going to make it your own Space Invaders, your own assets uh, with your own kind of, um, you know, kind of spin on Space Invaders. All right. Um, your game will include um, several game soundtracks, one pretty much for each scene or screen. So one for your your menu screen, one for your instruction screen, one for your gameplay screen, and another one for your end scene. You may also include things like dynamic sound where you could change a soundtrack based on some excitement that's happening in the game. You know, an example I always think of is the battle banjo from uh, from Borderlands, where the things are chasing you, and all of a sudden it's like that that exciting kind of music. And there's other ones, other instances of like like uh, that you might know uh, in the games that you play today. Um, you're going to include an internal document, uh, documentation for your game, which means a single script that basically shows, um, you know, a program header. Um, the source file name, your name. If you have other scripts in the in in your uh, um, that you submit for some whatever reason, all of them should have the same kind of like, you know, uh, identification information about you inside of them for you to get these these three marks. Again, each of these things is like three percent, let's say, of the actual project itself. Um, include a first draft of a short game design document uh, for your game that includes external documentation. The follow the following stuff. So notice that the mark distribution so far is 55 points uh, more or less for your user interface, just user elements. Like, for example, things like uh, sound stuff, your assets that you're going to put in your in your project, as well as a layout of your screen and all that kind of stuff. So 55 percent. But there's going to be 28 percent of your project for this first assignment is going to be planning. So your game design document. If you've never done a game design document on your own before because someone else was the game designer in previous game production sessions, now you're the game designer and you're the game developer and you're the game producer and you're everything. It's You are a single person uh, that's doing everything for your game for this kind of these two releases. And there's only two releases for your game, assets for the first release and the second release are going to be all the code. All right, so again, for your game design document, a company logo, if you have, you should have one from uh, previous times, previous uh, other courses or whatever. Um, you can include something like that. You can also create another one for yourself. Please don't take a, a, an existing company logo and use it as your own because this is representing you. Um, some kind of table of contents that lists all the, the contents in your uh, code. Um, or in your in your external document version history, we've talked about this before. These are important. Uh, detailed game description. What game are you making? Are you making a, a, a tower defense game? Are you making an old arcade game again? What are you making? Uh, how does your game function? How how do you control it? Are there certain touches or gestures that you're going to make? Imagine making a, a Pac-Man game for this for for here. How do you do that? You need some kind of on-screen controller or something like that in order for you to mimic what it would be like to play Pac-Man with maybe with one hand as an example or one finger. Um, now here you need a series of interface sketches which I like to call wireframes for your game. I want you to sketch out each of your screens, your menu screen, your instruction screen, your gameplay screen, your game over screen with all the appropriate labels that point out different uh, aspects of your screen. There's some great tools out there Hand-drawn sketches will not be accepted. They're not acceptable. So you need to use some kind of tool, even if it's paint, all right? It doesn't matter. You need to use your own tool to make this. And I recommend a couple of them. One of them that I recommended is, if I can get to the right uh, window, there we go, is Figma, all right? Figma is a nice tool that you can use. Uh, for mobile application development, I think it's a really great tool uh, because it allows you to draw out your screens and you can lay out your screen the way you want. You can include your own graphics and everything else. Figma um, is fantastic, especially if you're going to do anything like web development or something else. Uh, the other option that you can use is something called mockups. So here's mockups. I've, I've given you the links up here in uh, 
um, up on Blackboard. Mockups, again, there is a free to try version. Both of them are free to try where you can kind of sketch out your different scenes and our screens and then add your own graphics. One of the things is with both of these apps that you do not have free access to export. It'll ask you to upgrade, but you can always just take a screenshot of what you have here and that is good enough. Uh, for what I'm asking you for, because we're doing, again, we're using it for educational purposes. We're not selling something. Um, and I'm not asking you to subscribe or pay money for one of these kind of services at all. If you're using a Mac, if you're a Mac person, for whatever reason, you could use something called Sketch. Uh, and Sketch is a, a great platform for mobile development for Mac. Um, it's only available on Mac. So if you're, if you're one of those people, I recommend trying out Sketch, and they're not that expensive. Sketch is around, I think, with a discount, student discount, I think it's $50 uh, to, to buy if you're going to do this mobile development all the time. Actually, all of these apps are very simple, and they're not that uh, expensive to buy. If you're, if you're looking at doing this more often in the future, it's worth buying any of these things. Is, is kind of, uh, they're, they're kind of really good. So those are the three that I recommend. Plus, you can use Photoshop or Illustrator, or Paint, or whatever your favorite painting program is that's free. It doesn't matter, but what, what you want to do is create a low fidelity sketch, uh, you know, up here. So something like, that looks more like this, as an example. It doesn't even have to be colorful. It could just include things like, okay, so here's my screen. This is what, it, this is what my, where my level is. Here's my options for how this works. And you can drag and drop a lot of elements here, including images, okay, that you create onto your screen, but you need to kind of have an example of what this looks like. You can also include things like leader lines and labels that kind of labels what these things are, okay? So that is what's needed for your interface sketches section, okay? It's worth eight marks of your external document, all right? So please make sure you, uh, you pay this attention. Screen descriptions are just screenshots, so you want to take screenshots of your um, of your actual app the way it is in the first uh, version where you've laid out your elements you've taken some you've created some uh, assets or acquired assets and you've put them in place take some screenshots of your main main menu your instruction screen and all the other ones and include them here in a series you could have it in one panel or you can include it in a series of pages where you kind of say or side by side I've seen it side by side with the sketch so there's a sketch and then there's the actual. So planned and actual, what it looks like in Unity. Uh, they've done that kind of stuff as well. Um, game world, describe what your game environment looks like, what's in your game world. Uh, levels, describe your levels. You should only have one, but if you want to have more, you can. Vehicles and character, what's your character look like? What do they do? AI, how does it work? Weapons, what do they do? If they do anything, how do you score or progress? Your sound index and your multimedia index, what could be some uh, tables that include what your assets look like or sound like, some uh, links to where you get your assets from or how you made them, um, just something like that. So it's quite involved uh, to make a game design document this way, but that's why we're paying you 28% of, um, of what this thing is worth for you to make your game design document and go through the process. And then um, it must be up on GitHub. It's worth 4% or four marks out of 100. To put it up on GitHub, and for every release, every feature or asset you add in, you add additional additional commits for GitHub, um, and as well a short video um, is required to show off your uh, your application at this stage or this 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 uh, this portion of time, and to kind of show like, hey, uh, this is how my app works. Now, in order for you to be to get full marks for your video, you must include a first slide that's on your slide deck. Okay, you must have one slide, and that one slide, you can use uh, PowerPoint or Google Slides or whatever, and it must include a current image of you, uh, no avatars allowed. Okay, so it's gotta be you, don't please don't stretch your image and say, haha, this is me, or this way. It's gotta be proportionately, uh, the aspect ratio has to be correct, and it has to have a you know an image of you today, okay? Um, and, um, you also must include your full name on this on this slide, uh, student ID, the course code, course name, your assignment information. Hell, you can even include your logo because this is what you're making. Okay, and then you're going to have 
you're going to demonstrate your app in the simulator. You can also do it in the emulator if you've got that working or on the phone. One thing I'd ask you not to do is please don't record your screen from your cell phone. So don't do one of these where you kind of take a, your cell phone here and you're using your keyboard to control everything. Um, you know, that's not really something that is going to be acceptable. Remember that what you want to do is um, you want to record your screen with some kind of recording software. And at this stage, because you guys are all third year, the expectation is a little higher that you should know how to do that kind of stuff. So one uh, recording software that we recommend, uh, again, is OBS. So OBS is kind of the recommended software to use, but you can use other screen recording software of your choice, uh, whatever it is. Um, again, it's recording your screen, but also your voice. And what you're going to be doing is voicing over your video like you've done in the past. By the way, I'm also mentioning this for people that are coming into the course that aren't really following the regular course schedule or the return from a hiatus. Uh, there could be some people like that as well. Um, so, yeah. And here we are. So that's so that's the thing. Now, in order for this video to be acceptable, I have to be able to hear you and I have to be able to see your screen. If you make a video and it's completely not usable in any way, it's not a video, your video should run more, no more than five minutes in length. So I'm not asking for it to be very, very long. And remember that it is mandatory for you to submit your video for academic integrity purposes. If you don't submit a video, no marks. You're not going to get marked for this assignment. Uh, you need to do that. Um, the video, by the way, could be recorded on YouTube. Um, it could be uploaded. You could upload um, a link uh, from your Google Drive to Blackboard, but I want it to be links, not the actual video itself. Okay, so what I'm not looking for is, um, you know, 500 megabytes of MP MP4. As an example, please don't do that. That would be bad. Um, you know, I would ask you to do it again. Put it somewhere, put it on a Google Drive, put it on a, uh, a OneDrive, put it on a Dropbox, somewhere where I can uh, click it and make it run from that location. YouTube is preferred if, if uh, um, you know, if you get that. PowerPoint, I don't need your PowerPoint documents. So some people, for whatever reason, give me their PowerPoint documents separately. I don't need it. I just need it so that it's the title slide of your video. So you run your video, I see the PowerPoint document, the PowerPoint slide, the first one, that kind of like is uh, going to be the background for your first uh, for the first thing you say. You say, "Hi, my name is Tom." On this, uh, I I'm and this is my assignment one part one. Uh, my student ID is so on, and it's for course uh, you know game 2014 in the fall 2021 semester. And here's my assignment. You know, and go ahead and then go away from that. Uh, uh, you know, that slide. There's only one slide. It's just the title slide to show me who you are, and then you're gonna you know, do your video. That's why I, how I want it to be done. In the past, even last semester, I got all kinds of stuff. People missed the slide. Uh, people added, you know, other stuff in here. They recorded themselves. They used a cell phone to record. Please don't do any of those things. They're not acceptable. I won't accept it as a video. Okay. Okay. Um, and then from a breakdown perspective, it looks like this. 55% for your uh, UI, interface design, all that stuff. 3% uh, for your internal documentation. Just make one script, attach it to an object, and put some information in there. If you're actually scripting anything uh, for this assignment, for example, buttons to move around to demonstrate your one scene to the other, you need to put it in all the scripts that, uh, that you include. Um, external documentation is worth 28 marks or 28%. That is your GDD. You need to create that. You can make it with MS Word or PDF. I'm going to put a, an example up on Blackboard. I don't think there is one right now. Um, version control is 4%. So again, I want you to put up a proper re a repository as well, a properly named and working, accessible to me, and um, with that shows regular updates or regular feature uh, kind of uh, additions, if you will, and bug fixes if there's any, um, you know, on uh, on GitHub and your video presentation, with, with, which is worth 10%. When you submit your work, I'm looking for an external game design document. Um, a working link to your project files on GitHub. A project, uh, your project files zipped and submitted to Blackboard. Please don't give me RAR files. They're not going to be acceptable. And your short video demo link uploaded to Blackboard. I'm hoping it's a demo link. Please don't give me a video. And if somehow you missed the due date of this, right, 
don't send your stuff to me through email. Okay, that's not acceptable. I'm not, I can't do anything with that. Um, communicate with me if you're going to be late for whatever reason. Let me know. You shouldn't be because this is all asset stuff and there's some planning involved. Start today. Um, start collecting your assets uh, and, and get things going. Take a look at some things that might you you may have always wanted to do, some game, arcade game that you want to recreate or make your own as long as it meets the uh, tower defense or, you know, uh, scrolling game or something like that. It's OK, like I mentioned above. Um, and please avoid the games that I told you to avoid. Any questions around assignment one, part one? Again, this is due Friday, October the 1st, 2021 at midnight. It's week four. I know it's a lot of talking, but I had to go through it with you because um, I want to get you guys started on the right foot, if you will, um, and going in the right direction. All right, so that is assignment one, and that is posted up online on Blackboard. So you can see that under assignments. Uh, again, it's an individual assignment. It's right here. Uh, one thing that um, uh, for uh, tools, uh, that uh, that there's the tools link, but I also want to give you, I'm going to give you an external, uh, you know, document, right? So under course documents, you have, uh, you know, week one, blah, 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 and week two. And that's where I have uh, some stuff uh, for my PowerPoint slides from today, as well as the video that I'm making right now. But one thing you're missing is your an example of an external uh, game design document, and I'll include that later today. Okay. Any questions before we move on in the PowerPoint? So that's really assignment one details. Uh, what I want to talk about now is how do we design design mobile games and some some uh, you know considerations around mobile game design, uh, there's going to be some do's and don'ts that I want to kind of start with uh, today. And we're going to continue the design conversation as we go. Um, there's also going to be some code uh, recommend, uh, recommendations as we go from one lecture to the other. But for today, we're going to start off with things to do and things not to do. And also, I want to talk about some industry terms and metrics that we use to kind of discuss, uh, you know, kind of your uh, uh, your marketing of your game and just keep that in mind when you're making your game from the very beginning, elements that you want to include or not include. So, so why make a mobile game? I mean, we talked about this last time. There's a great, um, you know, kind of uh, market for mobile game development out there. That was what we talked about last week. But there's other reasons too. Um, in general, uh, mobile game development, it uses smaller development teams. Right, so you can make a small indie studio that makes a small game on a mobile device. Um, it doesn't have to cost you know millions of dollars to make or anything like that. The development cycle is shorter, um, and the ability for you to be your own publisher. These are all pluses uh, for for making uh, mobile mobile game apps, if you will. Faster payments because you put something on the App Store, whether it's on the, you know the Apple Store or Google Play or what have you. Um, you know, as an example, you get you get dinged a little bit, 35%, a little bit. Um, but um, you know, you still get the payment right uh, directly to you. Um, and there's no need to own your own servers, of course, because you're making a smaller, typically a smaller game, unless you're patching into something that already exists like Fortnite. Uh, but if you're making your own stuff, you can use a cloud-based services out there and pay for a number of players that you want to support and usually is uh, something that's kind of out of the box and available for you to buy, uh, usually either through Unity or your other commercial game engine. Um, and you also get immediate feedback from players if things aren't going well. So there's some really great reasons why a small team would might want to make a mobile game. Profit is another one that I haven't mentioned here, but there is money to be, to be made if you do it right. And we're going to talk about some strategies on how to do it right, potentially. All right. Um, but what about some negatives? Um, I have to talk about negatives as well. And one of the things we have to talk about is you're on your own. Okay. I mean, if you're making it yourself, then there's usually, um, you know, a lower in, in incentive for players to stick around. Why? Because most mobile games usually don't cost a lot of money. So they haven't um, had a real financial investment in your game. Usually it's kind of like a, uh, you know, 
uh, pick up and play type of game or it's a shorter commitment. And so a lot of times there's no reason for them to stick around. They'll move from game to game and try different things out. So you're kind of on your own when it comes to this kind of stuff. If your customers don't like your game, your players, they move on and you're, you've, you've been paid very little, if anything. And if this happens a lot, I mean, it could really affect the bottom line. Maybe you would be out of business. Um, and one thing that, that's happening is there's no marketers or other people to help uh, make your game. It's just you. You're everything right, for your game, you and your small team, typically. So that's a negative. Um, the other thing we want to talk about is you can't rest, right? One thing is that um, if you do make a game and it turns out to be awesome, and we have game examples out there, or it takes off somehow, I, I'm thinking about Flappy Bird or, um, you know, Angry Birds or something like that, people will copy you shamelessly. Like they'll, you know, copy you in other markets and, and take your ideas and just reskin your game and make it something else again. And again, what it can happen is they might make a game that's actually maybe in some ways better than yours because you've given them the assets or the idea, they've run with it, and they've they've iterated on your game, and they've they've taken market share from you, and now they've gone over there. All right, so that's something that can happen. You have to continuously do things like um, you know protect your intellectual property um, and all that kind of stuff on your own. It's quite challenging for you to do that. You're never done. Um, you know, one of the things that we just came up with uh, today was Apple uh, just released their, uh, you know, iPhone 13. Yay, iPhone 13 got released. And guess what? iOS 15 is official now. You know, just an example for Apple. It just happened, uh, you know, today, right? And that's awesome for Apple. But the, the, bad, the bad thing with us is if you're a developer, what they do is if you don't keep up with the latest version of iOS or the operating system, um, or if it's not compatible with the latest phone, they will stop operation of your app. And a lot of times what ends up happening is developers have to continuously update their app and keep it up to date because if they don't, it's off. You can't download it anymore. You can't even run it on your phone. It won't even run. So this is a negative thing. You're never done. You also have to worry about, um, you know, fending off your competitors and additionally coming up with more soft, more, uh, more content if you want to keep that game alive. Right or spin the game in some way, have additional seasons of content that you you include. Again, not so much on the mobile side, but it's it's there, um, you know, already. Especially when um, you have a game that you that you continually add new features and new content. Another version that just came out. Um, one thing is that nothing is free to you. If you do take off, you it's a pay as you go kind of scenario. You're going to pay for more server space. Um, you know, as an example, if your game mode or your strategy is free to play, and let's say, for example, you have a bunch of hitchhikers that come on and play your game for a while and then see you later, again, there's a chance that you can't monetize users and your the monetization, the, the profit making is all you. So it's the way you've marketed yourself and your game in order for you to attract and retain new users. Um, here's something that cheaters sometimes do when and what this means is that sometimes you don't know it, but when you release a game, especially from Unity, there might be an exploit or a cheat that you didn't know about. And if it's a multiplayer game, uh, it can really be off-putting to some people who don't know about this cheat, especially if they are, they're allowed to access your interface from other platforms. Let's say if you have, you have a mobile game, but there's also a, a web type game and there's also a console and you all play together on the same service or so cross-play and one uh, one uh, release, one target platform has a cheat. It can make people very unhappy. Um, and what you want to do is you want to stop that exploit or nerf that ability or whatever it is. And, um, you know, so that the cheaters, you know, are gone very, very quickly or it can break your game um, and people will run away from it. Um, now it's all about you. So when it comes to things like customer service, complaints, um, if you have trouble, if they want, people want returns because they don't like your game or it doesn't work for their system or whatever, it's all on you to fix that problem. So you now live to please is a good one. The other thing to note is that mobile games give power to the players because really at the end of the day, it, because they're not committed emotionally, um, you know, potentially to your game, because it's like, again, the, the environment, the use case as an example for uh, using a mobile game, 
is different than using a console or PC, right? It's kind of like, uh, you know, the pick up, pick up and play, um, you know, short kind of games and all that kind of stuff, you know, and normally they're very cheap to start with or free. People can just hop from game to game. So they really control, um, you know, the market, right? If a game is really popular, uh, players basically will tell you by buying your game or converting to a paid player compared to a, um, you know, kind of a, a free player um, that the game is great. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is, let's talk about some strategies to make it so that, um, uh, you know, it's attractive to play your game. One of them is make it easy to start playing. Okay, so again, I like this, this uh, you know, kind of uh, motto, which is you lose 50% of your users for every additional touch it takes them to find what they're looking for. And this applies not just to uh, to games, but any front end development, uh, web design. Uh, the more I have to drill down to find the answers that I'm looking for in a website, or the more I have to drill down to, um, you know, to get the information or access the area um, in my application that I want to, the more discouraged my users are going to be. The most important information should be right up front and easy to access as fast as possible. So it's a less of a barrier to entry into your game. Okay. Make it easy to stop playing. So starting play is really quick, but stopping play is really important as well. And again, you got to think about this: that um, mobile games, it's you know they're not going to they're not going to invest typically a large time commitment in a mobile game typically, right? Um, again, the example here is if you're a real hardcore gamer, then you know what it's like to end up delaying bedtime because you're going to go to the last, you're going to do one more quest or you're going to do one more thing. Um, but when it comes to turn-based games on a mobile phone, they basically just shut their 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 uh, their phone off, or they uh, they flip up their their app and they do something else. And when you do that, when you shut your phone off, pause the app, or something like that, what you want to do is a very quick way of uh, you know pausing your your game. That's what you want to do, so you can uh, instantly stop and instantly start back again where you where you left off. Because if you stop your phone, like you turn off your phone as an example, or you shut your phone off, uh, you close your phone, or you uh, flip the app up because you want to do something else as an example, and your app is closed and you've lost your progress, that's kind of, for many players, especially if it's a not, not a puzzle game, even if it is a puzzle game, uh, or something else, they're going to be very frustrated that they've lost their place. Uh, think about, I always think about... Uh, you know, playing a mobile game like listening to an audiobook. Imagine you're listening to an audiobook and when you close off, you know, you stop your audiobook, it starts at the beginning again and you've lost your place, right? That's really frustrating. And it can happen uh, with some audiobooks, if especially if your audiobook player is, is broken for some reason, right? So that's bad. Same thing with your game. You start off a game and then you close off your, your phone or whatever, and then your game progress is lost. That's really frustrating. So uh, stopping, making it easy to stop playing is equally as important as making it easy to start. And uh, make it easy to play with friends. Now, again, in this semester, we aren't focusing on multiplayer, okay? But remember that mobile, for the most part, for to be a successful uh, game, your game should also, should also be social. That's what studies have shown. And... Um, Social games mean some kind of multiplayer or chat or some kind of tie-in to a social network. And again, we might be talking about social networks later on in this semester when it comes to marketing your game and, and creating a community around your game as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, make it easy to play with other people. And if you do that, if you give a multiplayer mode to your game, it's going to increase the, the penetration or the interest in playing your game. And again, I think about games like Among Us, uh, which is a recent uh, popular um, mobile game that was a pick up and play game. You can play on the network or on, uh, on you know, kind of in, on uh, the local LAN as an example with other players. Um, and it was a very interesting game. It was uh, kind of uh, innovative in the way um, that it connected and allowed you to play with others.
All right, so that's kind of uh, make it easy to play with friends. The other thing is let the user decide how much is the right amount. If you're going to be doing something like monetization or you want to sell uh, all kinds of um, skins and fluff and things that make your game neat looking, um, you know, don't force them uh, to, to buy stuff if you can avoid it. Make it so that they can they can spend as much money as they want or as little money as they want. Uh, and I'll say this again later on, but uh, creating a game typically that is pay to play or even pay to win uh, is typically not desirable uh, for, for most players in most markets. Some markets, though, I have to mention, paying to play and paying to win is normal, right? Uh, but not North American markets typically. They don't like that. People don't like to do that. So there will be some places that, that are okay with that, some markets. Uh, but again, for the most part, uh, I always look at things like Fortnite as a model, right? The great reason why Fortnite worked as a monetization model with V-Bucks is because your V-Bucks didn't really do anything, right? At the end of the day, I mean, other than unlock access, again, to certain play modes, that definitely, if you bought a battle pass or something like that, it did that. But if you bought V-Bucks and if you bought skins uh, or whatever, or different looking, uh, you know, weapons, as an example, who cares? You're still able to play as effectively as the next person. You just looked a lot cooler. And it really worked, uh, you know, again, for Fortnite and other games just like that. Even games like Destiny, where you can buy skins uh, or textures for your game, uh, for your, for your uh, you know, the way your player looks and so on. And other games like that out there, it's totally okay to do. And it doesn't disrupt gameplay. It's not like you're buying a weapon that's more powerful than somebody else. So that kind of stuff is okay. Where it gets a little hairy is I want to purchase loot boxes. And I'm hoping that I'm going to get more loot that's not going to just unlock textures, but also unlock other abilities and those kind of things. That's where you play to win. And those kind of, of practices in, um, in North America are looked down upon typically especially when kids have access to this kind of stuff and, um, you know, people look at it as if it's like kind of gambling for kids. And that's really a negative thing. Um, so things like enhancements, let them buy whatever they want to buy. If you do include, um, you know, buying things, if you're going to, you know, kind of a target a market that allows you to buy items, you know, as an example, or buy ways to progress, uh, quicker. For example, I want to buy, instead of me creating something in a resource in the game, I want to fast track and go forward. I mean, make it so that it's fair, so that whatever you get makes sense. As an example, compared to people who just build it a little bit slower. If you make it super slow, like terribly slow, um, in the beginning, yes, it pushes players to uh, convert to buying some of your in in-game currency. But long-term studies have shown the players will leave to play games that are free to play. Okay. Again, unless it's a super popular game that everyone is playing. All right. That is my section on to do's to, you know, kind of do's and don'ts. Here are some industry terms and metrics uh, as an example, when it comes to, um, you know, kind of understanding how you're marketing and um, how your game is doing. Okay. So one of them is you always want to measure the player population somehow. How many total players are, you know, as an example, working or are playing your game? And you should know kind of have a, uh, an idea of how many of those, you know, how many players are doing that. But there's specific metrics that you want to look at. For example, one of them, and this is a standard in the industry, is uh, daily active users. How many daily active users? Um, and what it does is it measures unique players every day. So unique users. And why is this good? It's like, okay, I've got these, you know, 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 or 10,000 or whatever unique users every day. Um, all you need for this daily active user um, amount is um, just for them to log in your, into your game. As an example, once they start your app or your game, it's a hit. You've got a, a unique daily active user. And there's no minimum play time. Okay, that's for this metric. There's monthly active users, which is different than daily active users in that, you know, like it's kind of a, a floating 30-day average of, of how many users are on your game uh, per month. 
Um, again, it doesn't really tell you a lot. It just says like this many users. Uh, notice that there is no unique number of users, just like the total monthly users uh, kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, per month. Again, another indicator. This is a really good one. I think it's really important. You hear this in the news a lot. Peak concurrent users. Okay, so that's uh, PCU. And peak concurrent users is a good measure of like how, um, you know, popular your game is, as an example, compared to others. Peak concurrent users, example, uh, games like lately, games like Valheim and other games like that uh, might report things like, well, we had a million peak concurrent users, right? Um, as an example, as opposed to you might say daily active users might be something like, um, you know, um, they might be on, on average, it might be a lot lower than that. Maybe we only had 500,000 daily active users, right, as an example. But we had a peak. We had, we ran into some, you know, some people really been downloading this weekend. Uh, maybe it's a long weekend and we, we, we rose to a million active users, as an example, as a peak. This is great. And you want to use this as a metric to kind of uh, when combined with the ratio, which is daily active users over monthly active users, that gives you a, an idea of if my uh, whether the, the number is going up. So I'm getting, you know, an increase or whether the number is decreasing. In other words, it's slowing down, you know, as an example. So this this these two metrics in combination give you some really good information. Um, the other thing that you want to look at is you want to measure monetization. You want to measure how this works. And it really depends on your monetization strategy. So we got to talk about this a little bit. Now, why am I talking all about this when you, before you've even made your game? It could influence your design choices. Just like last, last week, we talked about how the market could influence your design choices. Maybe you're going to make a market for kids. Kids play mobile games a lot, right? Adults play mobile, mobile games more right? Well, relative to kids, what we talked about last week, because adults have mobile devices, you know, more mobile devices than kids do. Kids might have an iPad, yes, but all most adults have uh, some kind of phone, right? And most phones are, you know, mobile game enabled, right? So this is the thing. So that last week talked about how, what's your, what would be your target audience? Here is, how do I monetize? Am I going to have a freemium model Am I going to, am I going to create a model that is, you know, free to play until a certain point? And then after a certain point, let's say level two, um, you know, as an example, well, that's locked until you pay for the game, you know, kind of thing to, or you subscribe to the service, you know? Um, so there's different ways of doing that kind of stuff. So one thing that we also want to think about is conversion rate. So the conversion rate is really, um, of those users who try your game, how many are converted to paying users? So you might have a, you're in, in a freemium model, you give a chance for people to play a couple of levels, like we said, how many people convert and they want to continue playing, right? Third level, fourth level, fifth level, and on, um, as opposed, opposed to those people who didn't, okay? Um, again, the higher rate is obviously better. And things like um, when we think about conversion rates, you know, when you have a free uh, a freemium model. And again, I think about games like, um, if I'm not wrong, Catan and all that allows you to download the game for free. But in order for you to actually play the game, you know, you've got to pay, uh, you know, for the type of game you want. That's not really freemium. That's like, okay, well, I can download the game, but I can't do anything, right? Or in-app purchases are to the point where in, a, in, or, in order for you to play the game, you've got to purchase different things in the game for you to play. That's not really freemium again, right? So but from a conversion rate, when we measure conversion rate, we're like, hey, if someone's tried my game out and I'm getting some really bad, uh, weird internet uh, happening right now, guys. If I spark out, I apologize. Um, but I, I'm, I have a person that's, that's trying my game and now they're flipping to paying for my game. How many of those people, uh, how many people are doing that or how many are just hitchhikers? They're trying my game and they're going to the next game. Right. So that's important. What's your conversion rate? And uh, these are important things too. And this is important because we want to think about how much money you are making per user. So the average revenue per user or ARPU is really important because, uh, or dollar per user, some people call it dollar per user, is important. So we know uh, if I was going to buy users, and when I say buy users, I mean like let's suppose I have a policy in place that I say, well, if you're a new user of the game, 
a new player, you can um, refer my game to someone else. And if you do, and if they join the game, you get uh, you know access to, uh, as an example of two new levels or two free levels, or maybe you get access to the entire game. Okay, for every user you add, you get access to the entire game. I'm actually buying users that way, right? Because I'm actually instead of me making a conversion where the user's paying, I'm giving them the I'm giving them access to that to the uh, to the extra levels for free, right? Um, and again, yeah, if they speak, if they spend at least five bucks or something like that, it's normal. It's normal. These kind of incentives are normal. And I remember back in the day, not a mobile game dev, but let's suppose if for those people who uh, uh, for who use Dropbox for the first time, there was a new app. At back in the day called Dropbox. Now, of course, everyone should know what that is. It's similar to Google Drive or other things. And when you first signed up for Dropbox, they said, if you add a user, we'll give you extra space, right? We'll give you more space on Dropbox if you recommend our app, if, you, if they use your invite to add their download our app and subscribe to our service, right? Even though there was no monetary commitment, right? You can use the app for free, but you get extra space because more users will be using it. And the strategy there is, remember, number one marketing strategy is 100% knowledge of your product means people are going to buy it. That's really this, how simple it is. So imagine if we make a product today and it's an awesome product, but nobody knows about it, right? If no one knows about my product, then no one's going to buy my product. And let's look at the other extreme. Everyone knows about my product. Someone's going to try it, right? Even if it's a small percentage of people who try that product out, let's suppose 1%, if everybody in the world, 100% of the people in the world who have access to the internet try that product, right, or know about the product, only 1% of that population tries it, you've, you're, you're good, right? But of course, it's not like that. Um, marketing, what it, the job of marketing is really to get your product out there. And there's different ways of doing that. And one of the ways is this word of mouth thing where we want to purchase users or buy users, uh, as an example, by doing a couple of things. One, use ads, effective ads, as an example. Um, and, you know, and the way to know how to do that, how much you want to pay is how much average revenue per user, you know, are you going to get? You need to figure this out, right? Um, and you need to work that number out before you start buying users. So the other is, what about the average revenue per paying user? There's an average revenue per user, non-paying user, a hitchhiker or whatever. What do they do? Do they just buy skins and try out your game or whatever? What about the paying user, the person who subscribed to your, uh, you know, to your game? Do they use microtransactions? They, do they use in-app purchases? What do they do? And how much do they pay out? Um, they're the paying user, the people that subscribe or have already bought your app. And how much do they use? And then once you know that, what is the user acquisition cost? So, and again, we just talked about buying users, if in a way, if I know what my user acquisition cost is, so I know that, for example, it's going to cost me, you know, $10 to buy my user because, uh, as an example, if they were, or let's say 12, let's say they subscribe to my app that they pay a dollar a month to. Again, subscription models are really popular, but we're going to get, we're getting a lot of us are getting subscription fatigue. Subscribe to Apple Music, subscribe to uh, Prime, uh, subscribe to, you know, name it, um, uh, Disney Plus, as an example, subscribe to Apple Arcade, whatever. You get all this subscription stuff happening and you're getting, you're, you're subscribing to a lot. So people are feeling the subscription fatigue. But uh, let's suppose that we do this for, they're doing it for your app and they're paying a dollar a month, something that's less than a coffee, you know, however you market it, right? And then, you know, it's worth a user then would be worth $12 a year, right? If the user is worth, worth $12 a year, then um, if for the cost of acquiring my user um, could be something like, let's say, for example, I spend six bucks, six dollars acquiring my user, but I only make, you know, $12 for the entire year, right? So that first year is going to be a very expensive year for me as I acquire users. I give them free access. I give them free stuff to start using my app, right? Um, you know, and then the second user will be less expensive and the third user and so on because it's very expensive uh, to start acquiring users. We also have to know when, when it comes to user acquisition, it's really important to know the lifetime value 
of the most money I'm ever going to make from a user ever. And, and the way to know that is how long do you expect a user to stay on your platform? Again, you may not know what this is until you've run a mobile game platform uh, for a while. But let's suppose we use some numbers. Let's suppose you say that $1 per month and you expect to maintain or retain a user for about 24 months on average. That means total lifetime for that user for your particular app is $24. Because lifetime, it really depends on how long you, the user is going to stay with you, right? Now, I mean, if we, if we were to look at other apps, uh, you know, non-mobile apps where users stay with a, um, you know, a game, think about uh, GTA 5. How many years has that gone on? And, um, you know, as an example, what is the lifetime value of users for GTA or Skyrim, as an example, uh, or that kind of stuff? You know, th these people are still playing the game, still buying that game uh, every single year, even though they're more than 10 years old. Right. So, um, you know, at least Skyrim. So, and if you look back at, um, you know, lifetime value, it's important to know what that is. So now if, if you're, um, you know, the a user acquisition cost, UAC, you can't make that big, right? You know, you can't make that like half the lifetime of your, um, you know, of, of the LTV because then you've lost half your profit. You want to keep it as low as possible. All right. So here is the example. If you compare this number, so example, if, if an average user gives you one per month, and it lasts for 24 months, the LTV would be $24. If you compare this number against your, you know, your user acquisition cost and determine that you can acquire a new user for only, say, $14, then you can anticipate your profits will only be, again, um, you know, 14 minus 24, which would be $10 for the lifetime of the user. So if I had 50,000 users and they're all averaging 24 months, then you can see exactly over two years how much money you'd make over the two-year period. Right. So, again, it's it's tricky, but we do want to do some user acquisition. And the reason for that is because we don't have 100 percent marketing. Uh, and when I say user acquisition costs, that could be marketing, that could be advertising, that could be giving free stuff away. That could be a lot of all those things. Last point to make the lifetime network value. All right. So this is the, the idea where you want to get incentive. Uh, as an example, to recruit your friends, like we said that. Um, and again, it's difficult to predict um, what this value actually is, lifetime networking value. Um, and the reason for this is because we really need to be able to track uh, how much money we're giving, we're, acquire, we're, we're acquiring the user for, and we're paying uh, existing users for, for, for their acquisition. How long, on average, a user, like this is why it's difficult to track, a user that's attracted or recruited from one of their friends last compared to a user that finds the, the game on their own through advertising and whatever, and they become, uh, they are converted to a, uh, to a paying user. Okay, so those are the things we should consider. Again, industry terms and metrics. I wanted to share this with you because early and some do's and don'ts because I want you to think about this, how it could influence the way you design your mobile game. Okay, I've talked for about an hour and 15 minutes with the assignment one information, assignment one part one, as well as uh, with this stuff. How much value is a live stream, of a live stream content creator worth? <laughs> yeah, live stream. I don't know. It really depends on the, on the live stream uh, content creator. There could be worth a lot of money, a whole pile of money, in fact. And depending on who you are and how popular you are and how people know you, right? So, um, and again, I like the idea that uh, just to, just to um, piggyback on that thought uh, in relation to mobile games, how about those games that go viral? Like those games that are no one knew about and Flappy Bird comes out and everyone's buying Flappy Bird, you know, as an example for a dollar, um, you know, and how does that work? Well, it's, it's like people start talking about the game. It's marketing again. You know, you, you're talking about it, but you're social marketing. Uh, I'm talking about a game that I really love to play. So you try it and then you love to play it and it's addictive. And so you tell somebody else and they tell somebody and so on and so on. Like the old commercial that used to exist back in the day until a lot of people know about it. Six degrees of separation. If you tell your entire social network that you're playing this really cool mobile app, as an example, it's going to it potentially could go like wildfire, especially if it's an app that targets a wide audience. Um, that is fun to play 
and is a pick up and play kind of app with not so much commitment that you can turn off, start quickly, stop quickly, um, and all that kind of stuff. Those are the things that that really work when it comes to uh, um, the beginning, the fundamentals of making your app. All right, let's 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 uh, pause right now. We're sitting at about 4.20. Um, let's take a 10-minute break. So we'll come back at 4.30, and then we'll continue with the tech stuff that I want to talk about today with Unity um, and you know, um, and GitHub. It's going to be your first lab. So lab one uh, is going to be due this Friday at midnight. So if you look up online, if you go to labs, there is a lab one. So Unity and GitHub. It's due week two. That's this week. So Friday, September 17th, 2021 at midnight. And you're going to use the example in class I'm going to show you to put your Unity project up on GitHub. And I'll talk about some strategies and how to do that uh, when we come back from this short break. So for now, what I'd ask you to do, because for some people, launching Unity and LD Player or whatever the emulator you're going to use takes a little bit of time. Please go there, launch Unity. So when we come back at around 4.30, we'll start everything off uh, with you ready to rock and roll. Okay. Any questions before we take a short break? And I'm going to stop recording on, on um, YouTube for now. All right, so let's stop right now. Let's stop recording on YouTube. And um, again, 